Welcome my friends, this is Maniacal Incorporated and today I'm going to take a look at Ireland in the Viking Age as presented in Crusader Kings 2. There was an astonishing and awfully great oppression over all Ireland, by powerful azure Gentiles and by fierce hard-hearted Danes. For the space of eight score and ten years the whole of Munster became filled with immense floods and countless sea vomitings of ships and boats and fleets, so that there was not a harbour, nor a landing port, nor a fort, nor a fortress, nor a fastness in all Munster without fleets of Danes and foreigners. And they ravaged her kingdoms and her privileged churches, and her sanctuaries, and they rent her shrines and her reliquaries and her books. So says the Cogga Goel Regalov, The War of the Irish with the Foreigners, a history of the Viking Age commissioned in the early 12th century by the King of Munster and High King of Ireland, Murkartoch Uvrian. It sets out the popular narrative of this time period, of the island of saints and scholars upended by a relentless campaign of raiding and slaughter at the hands of the Vikings, coming to an end only at the Battle of Clontarf in 1014, when Murkartoch's great-grandfather, Brian Baru, led a united Irish army against the pagan foreigners of Dublin. I'll be dealing with the Battle of Clontarf in the next episode, but today we're going to take a look at the impact of the Viking arrival in Ireland. In 793 the Vikings appeared off the east coast of Britain for the first time, raiding the monastery of Lindisfarne which had been built by Irish monks from Iona almost 200 years earlier. The following year they sailed around Scotland and attacked Rathlin Island off the coast of Ulster, and in 795 they carried out the first of a number of devastating raids on Iona itself. Remote, undefended monasteries, many of which were used for the safekeeping of royal treasures, provided easy and attractive targets for this first wave of Viking raiders to hit Ireland. Lightning fast and no doubt terrifying for those who were put to the sword or carried off to be ransomed or sold into slavery. Raids were also infrequent over the first two decades of the 9th century. Likely originating from Norway, to where they returned after a successful foray, attacks in this period were largely confined to the coasts of Ulster and Leinster, and it would be the early 830s before significant raids were made into the other provinces. In 835 the Vikings manoeuvred up the river Shannon and raided the monastery of Clonmacnoise, burning part of it to the ground. This was a hard blow to the monks there, who were still recovering from an even more devastating raid two years beforehand, in which half of their number were slaughtered and the lands around the monastery were burned by an army of… fellow Irishmen, led by Philemid Macrithoin, King of Munster, Abbot of Cork, and eventually High King of Ireland and Saint. Historian Francis J. Byrne has described his career as follows. At a most critical era in Irish history, when devastating Viking raids were succeeded by permanent base camps and settlements, Felimede never once devoted his arms to attacking these heathen foreigners, but distinguished his martial career by burning and plundering some of the greatest of Irish monasteries. Nor was he alone in this. During the Viking Age, Clan Macnoise would be raided dozens of times, seven times by the Vikings, twenty-seven times by the Irish. Important political powers controlled by the local ruling dynasty, from which their abbots were drawn, monasteries on the borders of rival kingdoms were often ravaged in war by fellow Irish Christians who could be just as savage as the pagans from beyond the sea. A dramatic change in Viking operations occurred in the year 841 with the construction of a number of longforts, naval bases from which raids could be carried out without the need to return to Scandinavia during the winter. While many of these were temporary facilities, lasting for only a year or two, some were used as beachheads from which to establish permanent Norse settlements on the island. The most famous was built at a site known to the Irish as Auclea, though it would become better known for the Black Pool, or Dove Lynn, around which the settlement grew. These longforts presented the Irish with the first static targets that they could attack. A number of them were destroyed and in 848 forces led by the High King, Maul Shocknail Macmaul Runaid, killed over 700 Vikings in battle, after which an embassy was sent to the West Frankish King Charles the Bald, telling him of the victory. 
The embassy may also have included Sedelius Scotius, who established a centre of learning at Liege where he and other Irish refugees wrote, taught, and translated important Greek works into Latin. While the Irish were finally striking back, Viking raids continued, and the year after Malshachnail's great victory, the remains of Cullum Kill were evacuated from Iona for safety. Throughout the 9th century, religious institutions would flee to Europe to escape the Vikings, taking with them their treasures and their knowledge, bringing to an end what many historians consider to be the Irish Golden Age. Reeling from their military setbacks, the Vikings soon found themselves facing a new challenge. Even more Vikings. In 849, the Danes arrived and would fight for control of the Norse settlements in Ireland, sacking Dublin in 851. Amidst this pagan infighting, two men would rise up to exert their authority over all the foreigners of Dublin, Olaf the White and Ivar, who some historians believe to be Ivar the Boneless. These men jointly ruled Dublin, making it a focal point for Viking activity in the Irish Sea, while also seeking to impose themselves on the political affairs of the island. In 859, they allied with a minor but ambitious king, Curul Macdumlena of Ossory, in his war against his brother-in-law, the High King and the Bane of the Vikings, Maul Shocknail. In 862, the Dubliners joined with Aed Macneil, the King of Alloch, and Flan Macconing, the King of Brega, as part of a family feud being waged by various branches of the Enail. But from 863 to 871, these towering figures would focus their attention across the Irish Sea. In 866, Ivar captured York at the head of the Great Heathen Army, but the campaign drew resources away from and weakened the Viking settlements in Ireland. Ivar's former ally and the new High King, Aed MacNeil, sacked all the settlements in the north of the island, and Olaf's fort near Dublin was burned to the ground with over 100 Vikings slaughtered. Though both men are said to have returned to Dublin in 871, Olaf disappears from history and the annals of Ulster would record the death of Ivar, King of the Norse of all Ireland and Britain, in 873. With no clear successor to replace him, a long line of obscure figures battled for control of Dublin, and the settlement declined to such a degree that the Vikings were expelled by the Irish in 902. This period is referred to in the Cogga as the Forty Years' Rest. We can take this lull as an opportunity to look at how Ireland is represented in the 867 start in Crusader Kings II. The Vikings control Dublin, as they should, but they also control the awkwardly named County of Meath, which actually represents the Kingdom of Brega, ruled by a branch of the Southern Enail. Olaf controls this expanded Norse kingdom under the vassalage of Ivar the Boneless, who rules the Kingdom of the Isles, while his brother Halfdan reigns as Jarl of Jorvik. Brega formed the eastern part of the Kingdom of Meath, while in the west sits Flan Sinna, son of Maul Shocknail and his successor as King of Meath. In reality, Maul Shocknail was actually succeeded by Lorcan MacCahill, who was blinded after only two years. He in turn was succeeded by Dunica MacEdacoin, and the annals of Ulster say that in 877 he was deceitfully killed by Flan, son of Maul Shocknail. In true Crusader King style, Flan Sinna murdered his way to power. To the north, Aed MacNeil, also known as Aed Finlia or Aed the Fairhaired, ruled as chief of the Kennel Owen and king of Alloch, the overking of the northern Enail. With the death of his kinsman and enemy, Maul Shocknail, in 863, the title King of Tara, the overking of both the northern and southern Enail, rotated to him under a tradition at least 100 years old, and this also made him the High King of Ireland. On his death in 879, Tara and the High Kingship rotated back to the southern Enail incumbent, Flan Sinna. In CK2, however, Aed rules as petty king of Meath itself, with only a single vassal. The lands of the Kennel Connell, the other part of Alloch over which Aed's ancestors established supremacy in the early 700s, are a completely independent entity. In the 1337 start date, we can see that the petty kingdom or Duchy of Meath becomes vacant after Aed's death, remaining so until it is revived by the future King John of England in 1185, but that's a matter for another episode. 
The conditions as presented in the game are either a misunderstanding of the political situation of the time, or a valiant attempt to smash the five-dimensional peg that is medieval Irish politics into the round hole that is Western European feudalism. To accurately represent the rotating kingship of Tara, another level of ruler, referenced in the Brehan Law Tract, Shanachas Moor, the Great Tradition, would need to be inserted between that of Duke and King, basically a super duke of a super duchy. The Forty Years' Rest wasn't a period of total calm and peace, as the name might suggest. After gaining the High Kingship in 879, Flan Sinna looks to have set off an Enail civil war, as he attempted to keep the title in his branch of the family. He nominated his son, Maul Runaid, as heir-designate of Ireland, and backed by a contingent of Vikings in 882, he attacked Armagh. In 901, Maul Runaid was killed, and another of his sons, Donacadon, rebelled against him in 904. The rebellion failed, and Flancina breached the sanctity of the Abbey of Kells, seizing Donica, who had taken refuge there, and executing his co-conspirators. Flancina now found himself fighting a multi-front war in his efforts to secure the succession of his next son, Angus. In 905 he attacked his cousin, Calic Mac Carul, the king of Ossery, and in 906 he raided Munster. The Onacht responded, but their king, Cormac Mac was killed in battle fighting the Enail in 908, sending the dynasty into a death spiral it would never fully recover from. There was a heartwarming rapprochement in 913 between Flancina and his errant son Donica Don, when they attacked Brega and burned a number of its churches to the ground. In 911, however, Eod Finlia's son, Niall Glundov, Niall Blackney, succeeded to the kingship of Alach, and in 914 he swept into Meath, determined to protect the traditional rotation of the high kingship. In December, he met Flansena's heir designate in battle and wounded him. Angus failed to recover and died the following February. Shortly after, Donica Don rebelled again, and it was only with the help of Niall Glundov that Flan Sinna remained in power, but only in name. His dream of establishing his family's dominance over the High Kingship had ended, and following his death in 916, it rotated north, as tradition dictated, to Niall Glundov. You might look at Flansinna's actions as a desperate and selfish power grab, a spit in the face of Irish laws and traditions, but we should also recognise here an attempt to bring the unstable, rotating system of succession to an end and establish what could have grown into a unified, centralised administration. His efforts, however, and the threat that they posed to the branches who would have lost out, set in motion the ultimate downfall of the Enail. Although he had secured the High Kingship by ending the attempts at its reform, Niall Glundov would not enjoy his position for long. The Annals of Ulster for 917 declare that Citric, grandson of Ivar, entered Oclea. The Vikings were back. Determined to stop them before they could consolidate their hold on Dublin, a grand e nail coalition marched on the settlement on the 14th of September 919, consisting of the King of Brega, the King of Meath, the King of Arguella, the King of Ulla, and the High King himself. By the end of the day, at what would become known as the Battle of Island Bridge, they were all dead. Citric had inflicted a devastating blow onto an Irish political structure already weakened by infighting and secured the survival of Norse power in Dublin. The settlement would continue to play an important role in the wider Viking affairs in the British and Irish Isles, and the future kings of Dublin, descendants of Ivar the Boneless, known as the E. Ivar, would succeed in turn as Jarls of Jorvik. In 945, however, a king came in the opposite direction. Driven out of Jorvik the previous year by Eric Bloodaxe, Citric's son Olaf, known to the Irish as Amlieb Coron, took control of the settlement in Dublin. He took advantage of the severe political instability that had seen both Clan Coleman and the Kennel Owen lose control of their provincial over kingships, and he allied with Congloch Conba, the first High King of Ireland from Brega in over 200 years. 
In 949, Amlieb briefly returned to power in Jorvik before being deposed again by Eric in 952. Back in Ireland, he allied with Leinster to fight off internal challenges to his rule in Dublin. This alliance came under attack in the 960s from his wife's brother, the High King of Ireland, Donal Unail, a grandson of Niall Glundov, and head of the restored Kennel Owen. Donal sieged Dublin in 968, and Amlieb responded by sacking the Abbey of Kells the following year, aided by the King of Leinster, Murcha Macfin. A complicated patchwork of marriages, the backbone of political alliances in Ireland, led to continuous fighting between these men until 977, when two of Donal's sons were killed. Exhausted, he retired to the Monastery of Armagh and died in 980. Amlieb now saw an opportunity to take the Kingdom of Meath itself, and in 980 an army of Dublin Norse, led by Amlieb's sons, backed by contingents from the Isles, marched on the sacred hill of Tara. There they met the new High King of Ireland, Malshachnail MacDonnell, who brought their plans for expansion to an end. He crushed the Vikings and occupied Dublin itself. An old man by this time, Amlieb followed Donal O'Neill's example and retired to the Monastery of Iona, spending the last few months of his life in quiet contemplation, surrounded by the graves of those his ancestors had slaughtered. In the two centuries since their arrival on the island, the Vikings had undergone dramatic change. Amlieb had been baptised in 942 and would marry into the most powerful dynasties on the island. To cement his alliance with Leinster, he married Gormla, the daughter of its king, Murcha Macfin, and their son Citric would rule Dublin during the Battle of Clontarf, by which stage the settlement had long followed Amlieb's example and converted to Christianity. The Vikings had arrived bent on destruction and mayhem, but by the middle of the 10th century, having failed to carve out substantial kingdoms on the island, they had married into Irish families, adopted Irish names and customs, such as fosterage, and influenced Irish art and even the language itself. Pretty much all Irish naval terminology derives from Norse. They had been absorbed into the Irish political system, taking sides in the dynastic struggles their arrivals had exacerbated, and while Dublin was granted a level of autonomy. For now, no future High King's rule would be secure without exacting its submission. Finally, to end this episode, we rewind and take a look at Ireland in the 936 start date. The Vikings still have the County of Meath, but following the Battle of Island Bridge in 919, the Kingship of Meath and the High Kingship of Ireland passed to Dunica Don, or Dunica the Brownhaired. Following the death of the King of Munster in 908, fighting against Dunica's father, the Onoth were unable to agree to a successor, and the title remained vacant until 914 when a caretaker was appointed. Flath Burtok. King Fred! King Fred! Fred over here! Close. His name was Flartuk Mach Unvonin, an abbot from a minor dynasty unconnected to the Onoth. While he died in 944, which is used to mark the end of his reign in Crusader Kings II, it's likely he was driven from power in 922 due to infighting and Viking pressure. Amidst this upheaval, Dunicadon sought to destabilise the Onoch further by allying himself with an insignificant dynasty in in Thuavuan, North Munster. Led by their ambitious chief, Kinetig MacLorcan, the Dalgash had fabricated a genealogy linking them to a purpose-built ancestor, Cormac Cass, a brother of Owen Moore, the mythological founder of the Oanacht. With this, they claim the right to the joint rule of Munster, and almost all of Kinetig's sons would be killed in battles seeking to further this aspiration. Following the death of the family's first king of Munster at the hands of the Vikings in 976, they were left with one last roll of the dice. In the next episode, I will deal with the rise of their most famous scion, Brian Baru, his seizure of the High Kingship of Ireland, and the Battle of Clontarf, where once and for all he drove the Viking pagans from Dublin. Wait a minute. Didn't they convert to Christianity in this episode? <laughs>